Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. All right, watching everybody get to file into the Zoom webinar. I like how it always makes everybody come in single file, apparently. Welcome in, welcome in. Okay, we'll give it a second, make sure everybody is in and connected to audio and ready to roll. But uh, I do want to jump in. As always, we, we always have a lot to cover on these monthly sessions. And this month, our topic is how healthy is your data? That's what we want to be looking at this month. Uh, so before we do get started, to give everybody a chance to get settled, we do have a few housekeeping items to attend to. We will do that now. First things first, today's presentation is being recorded, and we will be making this available on the Training Academy page. So you can access that from right within Virtuous. Click on that mortarboard hat, go to training. As you already know, you can watch recordings of any of our past webinars there. This one will be available tomorrow so that you can watch the replay, share it with friends, enjoy it uh, over the weekend, however you'd like to do that. Now, because we are recording and because this is a webinar, that's kind of common nowadays, all attendees have been muted. That will help us get some nice clean audio, hopefully for today. But that being said, we always encourage questions. This is really your chance, right? You've got the trainer here in the dunk tank for about an hour. And if you have a question about today's content, about something that's not today's content, but is hopefully at least related to Virtuous, you can go ahead and use that Q&A feature to submit that question. You should see that in the webinar controls there. Just click on Q&A. You can send in that question. And if you do think of a question, just go ahead and send it when it pops into your head. That way you don't forget. But we'll hold those questions and we'll address all of those towards the end when we get to the Q&A portion for today. That should make things a little bit easier for everyone. Uh, just in case anyone does not know who I am, my name is Scott Richards. I'm the Director of Training and Education here at Virtuous. If you've watched any of our training videos, you've already been subjected to my voice. I apologize. You're going to get a little more of that today. Uh, and in terms of what we want to cover today, as always, we want to take a look at some of the latest release features. Seems like, you know, this stuff just came out. We had the new view on the contact record and some new custom field types and options and even the ability to format your custom fields into groups. We'll look at a couple of those. And one of the big new features that was going to be part of our featured content today is really around data health and some of the data health tooling that's available in Virtuous. And first off, we want to look at why data health matters, why this is important. It's one of those topics that is not very um, exciting, but it really is foundational to having a good, strong, uh, robust fundraising program. So we'll take a look at that. Then we'll look at some of the new data health tools. And we're also going to get a chance today to take a sneak peek at some of the changes to those tools that are coming in our release just next week. So we're going to be looking a little bit into the future to give you an idea of what's going to be available. And we'll also talk a little bit about how the NCOA process works. Now that that's built into that data health section, we'll see how that works and how you can take advantage of that. And then, of course, we'll have time for questions. And then we'll wrap things up for another month here. Okay. Uh, so without further ado, let's jump right in. We do want to look at some of what we always call the latest developments in the system. So switch gears over here. We'll take a look at Virtuous proper. Uh, so in this last release, we did release an update to the donor home screen view or the contact overview. We did move those tabs from the top of the screen underneath of that header. That way that header gets pushed all the way to the top. Right, so if you keep going up there to click for giving, it's been moved a little bit further down. Of course, the bigger change is here on the home screen where we took that communication history, which was a small little widget, and we really kind of blew that up to make that a little bit more robust and to make it a little bit easier to manage and to view, okay, uh, over here on the right. That means we've taken that box with all the household information, and the individual information, we've moved it a little bit over here on the left. Okay. And we also gave you the ability to expand or collapse all of these panels as needed. Right. So here I've got everything collapsed just by default. So when I come in here, I can look and see some of the basic name for this household. I can see they've got nine tags. 
they don't have any donor search data because I don't have a re refresh icon here. So that tells me I've never searched for wealth data for them. I've got about five relationships there enrolled in a whole mess of automation workflows. That's a lot. Uh, and I've got them on about four different email lists. Okay, and then if I want to expand any of these and see what those tags are, I can go ahead and do that. There's my list of all those tags. I can click on show more here to make sure that I'm seeing addresses in this default view. And again, if you would like to be able to see just the wealth data open as soon as you come into a record, if you'd prefer to be able to see relationships at a much quicker glance, you can collapse some of these other panels by default and then make it much easier to get that data right in front of your eyeballs whenever you bring up a contact record. And however you leave this, so if right now I were to navigate to some other records, all the other contact records I open are gonna open this same way. Everything will be collapsed, but the relationships pane, that would be open whenever I go ahead and do that because that's what I've now set as my preference. You can see the same thing here. Everything else is collapsed, but I do see relationships open by default. There we go. Now over on the right, you've got some more controls to see just the data that you want to see or just the data that's going to impact you over here. Okay, so this feed here is actually combining those of you who are admins, you used to have access to the audit log in Virtuous, right? That showed you all the different changes and actions your team has taken. We've taken that audit log and we've incorporated it into this overall feed. Uh, if I don't want to see updates from the audit log, for example, when email addresses get changed and here when uh, gift ask gets updated, I can come into this team activity and say, please don't show me audit log updates. I don't really need to see those. Okay. Um, I can come in and say, I don't really want to see any workflow results from the system. That's totally fine. Maybe for communications, I'm not too concerned about email. So I won't see all those opens and clicks and things like that. I don't want to see when someone is added to segmentation. So if there are certain things that I know I want to see at a glance, and there are certain other things that are not part of my worldview, I can customize this feed to show only what I want to see. So it's all designed to give a little bit more control over how you're viewing that contact data. Okay. Now that's just one of the features that we had in the last release. One of the other features that came out was related to custom fields. There are actually a couple things related to custom fields. And by the way, I do see questions come in and that's fantastic. Um, if you do have questions, just keep those coming in and we'll address those when we get into the Q&A. All right. But with regard to custom fields, we had a few changes here in the custom field world. So we'll go to data customization. We're gonna go to custom fields. And by the way, just a quick uh, teaser, we will have some uh, additional changes to custom fields and, and custom values coming in the release next week. You'll see more about that in just a couple of days. <clears throat> but here, if I wanted to come in and create a new custom field, I can still do that. Uh, and we've added a new type for custom field, which is paragraph. And in doing that, we've limited text custom fields to 140 characters. Previously, text custom fields had no restriction, and that meant that they were really not performant in queries. Now, text custom fields are not ideal for queries anyway, because just by their nature, the data can be formatted in any which way, words can be spelled, phrased every which way. You're really at the mercy of how someone chooses to enter data when you use a text custom field. Anything that you're going to be using in queries, in segmentation and things like that, if you can standardize values and create a list custom field, you're going to be in much better shape, always. But sometimes you need a text custom field. The text is gonna vary. So now you have that text custom field option. And if you are gonna use longer values, then you can select the paragraph type. As people are starting to adopt more responsive fundraising tactics, right? We're seeing more people use things like lead forms to capture information from folks. And there might be open-ended questions on those lead forms. Tell us a little bit more about your experience with X. In those types of scenarios, that's when you'd want to use a paragraph custom field type. 
Don't limit the response. Let that respondent type in as much as they want in that field, but just know that's going to be a little less structured, right? And I'm not really going to be using that ideally for queries or for segmentation. Not really the ideal way to go. Okay. We've also changed a little bit about how list values are populated now in custom fields. Right, give you a little bit more of a change there. But the bigger change, I think, for custom fields is not so much that we have some of these new types, but it's the ability to create groups. Right? So now I can group my custom fields together to make it easier to display that information and easier to digest that information, either when I'm editing a record or when I'm viewing a record. And these groups apply anywhere that I have custom fields. So I can come into my actions and create a custom field, or I could create a custom field group, right? So I could come in here and say on a contact record, I'm going to have um, a donor history. There we go. And I can save that custom field group, or maybe we'll say, uh, I don't know, sponsorship. That makes a little bit more sense because most of what I see is donor history, right? Uh, but I can go ahead and add in sponsorship. And so now I can view that and there it is. There's no custom fields in this group yet, but that group now exists. And once that group exists, then I can come into my custom fields. I can edit any one of these like 2017 sponsorship and I can add it to my group. So I could say, hey, that's gonna be part of the group sponsorship. There we go. Uh, and maybe I have a few of these different sponsorship fields that I want to add in. Here's one for gold sponsor. We'll add that one into sponsorship as well. There we are. Uh, and let's see, January mid-level outcome. Eh, sure, just for now. I want to have a third one in there, so we'll, we'll pick it. There we go. Okay. So now if I go back to my groups and I go back to sponsorship, when I go to view that, I'm going to see that I've got these three custom fields that are now built in to that custom field group. So when I go to view a contact record, so if we went back to our buddy Tony Stark here, for example, there he is, and I show more information. We don't have anything in that group right now. But when I go to edit, his record, I'm going to see the other custom fields that I have, which are kind of a little unstructured, right? They're going to be in here. And then underneath of that, I have my sponsorship group that has all the sponsorship custom fields. And from there, I could say that he was a benefit party vendor. He is a gold sponsor. And uh, I guess, yes, uncertain. We can save that. And now I'm going to see all of that in here, and it's specifically going to be under that sponsorship group, right? So I've created that grouping for those fields. Again, this applies here. This will apply on an individual record. I can have this apply on a gift record. I can group gift custom fields. So if I have a number of fields that all apply to a specific, um, you know, specific information that I want to track, maybe it's about gifts in kind. I want to track a few different data points about gifts in kind, and I'd like to group all that together in the gift in kind group. Great. I can go ahead and do that. Okay. So those are some of the features that we had in that last release. Now, one of the other features that was in our last release, like we mentioned earlier, is the data health. And that was not a big thing. And so now we want to talk a little bit about how healthy your data is. And first off, I mean, why is that important? Why does that matter? Like I mentioned earlier, if you're a, you know, a database person, if this is what you do day in, day out, you eat, sleep, and breathe data, I think that it makes sense to you that you want to have the cleanest possible database. And outside of that, um, while I don't think people think that a, a dirty database is a good thing, necessarily, I don't think anyone would say, yeah, it's fine if the database is a mess. Uh, how important that is or how high that is on someone's priority list may vary, right? If I'm really focused on just reaching out to major donors, connecting with them and having a meeting with them, that's great, 
right? Um, and that's my, that's my worldview. I might not be thinking about how bad the data is in the database, but having a dirty database affects me too, even if I am a donor rep and, and I'm not sitting there building queries and running reports every single day, right? And a couple things here, I mean, I could have put in a bunch of slides. I didn't want to spend too much time on this because I'd like to spend some more time in the product. But in terms of why data health is important, first and foremost, right, bad data obviously can mean spending thousands of dollars more than necessary when I'm doing mass mailings. And not only does it mean spending more than I should, for example, based on the cost per piece, if I'm mailing uh, out and I'm mailing to a couple of thousand bad addresses, right? Well, I spent the money, I've got a sunk cost on the mailings that I, that I sent that were never going to return any, anything. They were never going to yield anything. But there's also the opportunity cost, the loss of revenue on the other side, because when I built my mailing list, I chose those couple thousand records over some others in my database that may have had good data. And when I look at the response rate for my mailing and I look at the average gift size for my mailing and I think about the fact that maybe 3,000 or you know, 5,000 of those records, I can just lop off because they were bad. And then I think about what if I had had 5,000 records that were good in their place instead, well then I start to multiply. Right? I start to see really how much that's costing me. Now, to put this in perspective, and this is from the corporate world, so of course it's going to vary for nonprofits, but uh, IBM actually did a study on this and they reported that bad data is costing all US companies $3 trillion per year, right? And that's insane when you think about that, that loss of, of revenue just being chalked up to having bad data in your database, unreliable data in your database. And when we talk about being a nonprofit and in particular wanting to be a more responsive nonprofit or a responsive fundraiser, I need to be able to rely on my data, right? I need to know that my data is clean because I'm going to use that for segmentation and ultimately for personalizing my communication. If the whole idea is to be able to humanize my communication with my donors and to be able to personalize communication based on what I know about them, I need to be able to trust what my database is saying that I know about them, right? And at an even more fundamental level, if I want to be able to take advantage of features that help me scale, features like automation, features like sending letters automatically, right? Letters on demand and things like that that can have a huge impact with my donors. Well, if I want to be able to do that, I need to make sure that I've got reliable data because I'm going to count on putting that data to work for me to help manage relationships with a large segment of my donor file while I spend some of my personal time and attention really zeroing in on you know, the top portion of my donor file where I'm gonna be having in-person meetings and things like that. Right now, probably still Zoom calls and things like that, but the same idea, right? But I can't have my database doing all that work for me. I can't put it to work and have it do things that scale if I can't trust the data that's driving all of those processes. So that's why this really is vital for any organization. Right? It does impact fundraising. If I can't trust the data that I see in the database, when I try to call my major donor, I might not be getting a hold of them because I don't have reliable phone data. I can't send them an email because I don't have reliable email data. Right? It really does affect everybody. So in terms of uh, addressing this, we've got the data health tools. Do, 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 do. Uh, and that's still got that little new flag on it, right? Because that's the new Data Health Center. And that's where we've got our merge contacts. Merge contacts existed prior to the Data Health, but we've kind of added to it and given us a, a more robust suite of tools in here. And then we've also got the ability to review bad addresses, bad phone numbers, and bad email addresses. Now let's talk about each of these here. And as I do this, I'm actually going to leave this environment behind, okay? And I'm going to move over here to this other tab 
So this is in another environment. And this is where I've got the ability to show you some of the things that are going to come out in our release that's coming next week. Because we are making some changes to the data health area. And some of this is based directly on feedback, probably from some of the folks that are here on the webinar today, I'm sure, in terms of trying to make these tools a little bit more efficient for you. Okay. So first off, when I look at my merge contacts screen on the front, again, this hasn't changed a whole heck of a lot, but having duplicate data in my database is not ideal, right? That's going to that's gonna be a mess. If I start crediting gifts to the wrong record, and then I say, hey, I'm going to call Kathy Carroll, but some of her gifts are associated with a duplicate record somewhere else, it looks really bad to say, thanks so much for your, you know, giving us X amount of dollars life to date, when she really says, no, I've, I've given given twice that life to date. Oops. I really put my foot in my mouth and I really made it hard to build that relationship. So whenever I come here to look for duplicates, right, the system is automatically going to identify duplicates. Now it does not do that search all by itself. I'm sure most of you know that, but want to make sure we're all on the same page here, <clears throat> right? If I want the system to go find me duplicate records, I come up here to my actions and I can say, hey, I'm going to run a search to go find duplicate records. And then the system will go out and do that search. It'll do that in the background while I go do some other things. I don't have to sit here and wait for it. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't recommend that you do because it can take some time, especially depending on the size of your database. And then once that's complete, it'll have identified all of these potential duplicates for me to review. Now, as this data sits here, I may be doing other work in the database. I may be going in and fixing email addresses and phone numbers and things. Maybe I had the same phone number, same email address on both these records, and I really shouldn't have. And I went in and I cleaned up that data. That's still going to show here as a potential duplicate. Right? That doesn't affect what I see here. Unless I come in here and I say, you know what, it's been a while since I ran this search. I want to make sure that I, I clean this up. Let me go ahead and refresh this page. And refreshing the page will clear the duplicates that are here and rerun that search. So if I've cleaned up the data elsewhere, that'll make sure that I'm not reviewing things here that never needed to be reviewed to begin with. If I come in when I already have records here and I say run, that's just going to add to the list that's already here. It's already identified. Now, once I come in to review a duplicate, right, I can click to compare those two. And that's going to show me the two records side by side. And when I merge data, first I have to choose which account I'm going to merge data into. By default, it's going to be the one on the left. Or I could choose to merge into the one on the right. What happens functionally is that one of these contacts is going to be preserved. The other contact will be archived. So that archive basically, it doesn't exist anymore, right? It's gone. And all of the data, the giving and the tags, other things, the notes, they'll get moved over to the record that I keep. Okay. And then I've got some checkboxes in here to be able to choose which individuals I'd like to keep. Now here I've got two Kathy Carroll. She's got the same name, same email, same phone. So I probably only need one of those. But if one of these two records had additional contact methods, maybe it has some social media handles or some other things, Maybe I want to keep them both so that then I can combine that data myself. Same with addresses. I can choose to just keep one of these because they're identical. If I have some different addresses on one versus the other, great. I can pick and choose which addresses I want to keep. I could keep both of these addresses if I really felt like it. It's not an either or, right? Just select the ones that you want. And then with organization groups and custom fields, I can choose which values to preserve in the merge. Here we don't have custom field values, so I don't have a problem. But if I were to merge these two records together, well, then I've got you know, a value A in a custom field on the first record and value B in a custom field on the second record. I've got to choose which value am I going to keep. I can't put both values in the same field. So that's why I'm going to pick and choose. Then when I hit merge, it's going to do exactly what we said. It's going to archive the one, merge everything into the other record. Once I merge two contact records together, there is no unmerge. Keep that in mind. I can't undo that. 
right? Can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. So I want to be really cautious about this. Now, there may be cases when two records are flagged as potential duplicates, and really they aren't. Right? These two are not duplicates. They just have some similar data on them. I happen to know this one has some of the same email addresses. So when I go look at it, I see all that here, and I say, oh, these two are not really duplicates. And next time I search for dupes, I don't want to keep seeing this. That's when I can say, you know what? I want to ignore this pairing. When I ignore that pairing, that means that the system is not going to show me that ID pair as potential duplicates again. It's now learned not to show that to me again. If at any point I want to review which duplicates I've ignored, I can come in here to actions and I can actually view all the ignored matches. It'll show me all those matches, including whoever it is that did the ignoring, right? So I can see, okay, what's happening here? Why am I not seeing this as a duplicate? Well, maybe I ignored it at some point in the past. Now, all that's pre-existing. Right now, we've got some of these new features here for addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses. So when I come in and view addresses, you've probably seen this one here. Accurate latitude, longitude cannot be identified for this street address. Right? You'll see that in a couple of places. If I come in to edit that particular record, right, it's going to show me that that's the reason why this is happening up here. Now, that may not mean the address necessarily is bad, although it could. What that means is when we went to geocode this address, we were not able to geocode this specific street address for whatever reason. Maybe the address is typed in incorrectly, right? Maybe it's, it's not uh, formatted correctly. We don't know. But from here, I can go ahead and correct that, and then I can save it. Now, you're going to notice some new buttons in here that you will not see if you go into Virtuous right now. And that's down here at the bottom of the screen. We've got a couple of these buttons in red here, right? We've got this to delete and to ignore. Now, that came out of some direct feedback from you guys, okay? Um, because if I wanted to delete this before, I couldn't do that from here. I'd have to go to the contact record and delete the address, but now I can. And if I want to ignore this warning, I can choose to do that too. But I wanna be very clear about what that means. Because there have been a lot of cases where someone has a partial address. I have no street address, but I've got city state zip. The system is gonna flag that as an invalid address, it's incomplete, it's missing data, right? And if I look at it and say, yeah, I know I don't have address line one and I'm never going to have an address line one for them and I'm kind of cool with that, I could choose to ignore that and that's okay. But that does not clear the little red triangle, the little flag that's gonna be on that address. You can see Secret Lab has that little red triangle on it saying it's bad address. That is not going to go away once I click ignore, because ignoring doesn't make the address good. It just means I don't want to see it on the data health screen anymore. I'm kind of okay with it the way it is. Okay, Because if I wanted to send mail, if I wanted to use letters on demand and send out letters, I can't use that address for mailing. So we need to make sure that we know, hey, that's still a bad address. You can't send mail to that. If you want to do mailed receipts and you choose the option to print labels or print envelopes, that's going to get flagged as an exception. You can't mail to that address. So it's still going to show as bad. We're not going to clear the red triangle, but we will remove it from this list so you don't constantly see it here telling you, hey, your address is bad. Okay. And from up here in the upper right under actions, I do have the ability to run address data health, just like running the search for potential duplicates that will go out and find addresses for me that I need to be able to review. Now, when it comes to phone numbers and email addresses, the tooling is a little bit different. You'll notice there is no blue button here to go ahead and run a search. And that's because in most all areas of the tool, we actually have validation for phone number format and email format. However, when we migrate legacy data, there are certain things that will not be validated simply because we couldn't validate all of those values. Some of them will come in and then they might be flagged for review. So data that shows on this screen will only come from legacy migrations or legacy data that's been imported to Virtuous. If any of you are using those legacy tools to import contact methods or addresses, 
things like that, or individuals even, then same thing. Anything that comes through there that would be flagged for review will show up on this screen. Okay. And you'll see this not a valid phone number format probably comes up a lot. And that could be because you've got something like this, with like the extension. Sometimes we'll see these, Bob Sell, or I am listing the number, but do not call this person. Right? These are some fun examples that I plugged in here for formatting. Now, the thing to know about phone number formatting right, is we can only build validation for formatting according to US format. So there may be times when you have a valid foreign phone number that's in a different format other than US format, and that may be flagged as being not a valid phone number, and that's okay. You can go in, you can say you want to edit, and you can just say fix phone number, which is basically to say, yeah, I know, I want to save it the way it is, or ignore this, I'm not worried about it at all, and that's okay, right? Um, but we do want to flag these invalid formats so that any of these examples where you do have text and notes and things like that in here, you can make sure that you catch. That's, that's the intent of the phone number formatting that we're flagging on the data health screen. Now for email addresses, you'll see the same thing. And I wanted to use this to show another example of a review reason that you may have already seen if you're reviewing data health. Or maybe if you haven't been there yet, you might see this now, which is to let you know about assumed primary contact methods, right? When you import data, and we use our legacy import tool, when data comes from another system, we may not always have something that identifies an email address or a phone number as being a primary phone number, right? I might get three or four email addresses for Frank Baxter here. He's the first one in the list. And of those email addresses, I don't have any one of them that says that it is the primary email for that person. Excuse me. Man, sometimes you just need water. So in those cases, <clears throat> Virtuous needs to set a primary. We need a primary phone number. We need a primary email address. And we need a primary address for a contact record. So in all of those cases, if, if data is imported and nothing is flagged explicitly as the primary point of contact, we're gonna use whichever was first and we're gonna assume that that is primary, okay? And then we're gonna flag that for you here to say, hey, just so you know, there's nothing wrong necessarily with this email address, uh, but we assumed that it was primary. We don't know for sure. So if that's good, that's great. Just go ahead, you can review it, and you can say, hey, I wanna confirm that's primary. That, that's fine by me. If it's not primary, then you'd need to go to that contact record, you need to go to Frank's record, and you'd need to set the correct primary email or primary phone. And remember, that matters. Because when I'm sending emails, whether they're going out through automation, whether I'm sending a mass email, if someone has six email addresses, I'm not sending an email to all six of their email addresses. I'm sending an email to whichever is their primary email address by individual. So if I've got three individuals on a contact record, each of them has a primary email address, each of them will get that email. But if each of those people also has several other email addresses listed, they might be old, they might be bad, they might be whatever, those email addresses will not get that communication. Okay. Primary matters when it comes to email, when it comes to address, because I want to make sure I'm sending mailed receipts and letters to the correct address, right? Primary matters. Okay, so we need to assume, but you know what assuming does to you and me. So we wanna make sure that you have the chance to review those and confirm that they are correct. Again, it's not gonna you know, break anything necessarily in virtuous, but we wanna make sure that there's some clarity there so that you can see those. So that's what's happening with these two. Now, the other feature that we introduced with some of these new data health features uh, I just said the word feature twice. That's a lot of feature, feature, feature. Um, and here, we'll leave this behind now. We don't need to worry too much about what's coming because this is already there. But on the addresses tab, in addition to being able to search 
for addresses. You can also come in here and you can actually request an NCOA update. Now, some of you may already be doing this through your mail house or through some other third party. You know, it depends on how you want to run those uh, updates, but you can request an NCO update directly through Virtuous. Uh, there is a support article that runs through a little bit more of the process so you can kind of understand, but you'll see pricing set right in here. And the way that this works is we need to have a contact query that you would like to use to be able to send, to, to process your NCOA update. Hey, which records do you want to submit for that update? When you do, we're going to review the primary address for those records. I apologize if anyone can hear my dog going nuts in the background. We just got a package delivery. It's a very exciting time. The joy of working from home. Uh, but in here, I need to have a saved contact query. And I can go ahead and I can choose that query, active donors last two years. And then that's going to immediately say, okay, that query has 940 total contacts in it. So based on the pricing here, that means that the cost to do an NCOA update on this would be 200 and $95, okay? Um, if I want to do that, that's great. Then I can move forward with that update. But when I do, I'm gonna need to set some parameters in here because when we do an NCOA update, we're gonna do a couple of things. If an address for a particular contact is bad, shouldn't be used, and there is no good or forwarding address for that particular contact, then we will add a tag that indicates that they are a bad address and they should not be mailed. You will then select the tag here, whatever we should use, right, for that, for those records. So I could say no direct mail. If I'd like to have an explicit tag that says bad address per NCOA or something like that, I'll need to go create that tag first, okay? Then I need to select a note type. Because any record that we update via the NCOA process, we're going to put a note on that record to indicate that we updated it. And we'd like to know what the note type is for adding that. Now, you could say, I just want it to be general. But if I want to be able to easily query for everybody who I did have updated through that NCOA process, creating a specific note type for NCOA update that's really gonna be ideal. Gonna make it much easier for you to track down those records or to see them through a query. So I would recommend going and creating that as a custom note type, right? And then I can come in here and I can select that from the list. And then finally, we're gonna want an address label because in cases where we do have a new address, we wanna add it to any of those contact records and we will add it as the new primary address. That's what came back from the NCOA we need to have a label for that address. We could say home, right? We could say new, but again, if you'd like it to be a little bit more explicit so it's easy to identify which addresses were found via the NCOA process, then you could say, I want the address label for all of these to be NCOA June 2020. Once you've selected the contact query, which tag you'd like to use, which note type you'd like to use, then you can click request NCOA, and that'll kick off the process with our internal team, okay? Once that comes into our team, we'll send you an invoice for running that NCOA update, and our team will work on turning that around and updating those records for you in Virtuous. So we wanted to try to make it as easy and as sort of streamlined as we can to update data, make sure you can identify clean data for your records and be able to do it right through Virtuous Proper, okay? So between these features that are already in here, some of the new features to be able to delete or ignore any values that have been flagged for data health, all of this is designed, again, to try to help you have a clean, reliable database so that you can do some of those things that will scale, so that you can use automation, you can use some of those tools, and you can do that with a little bit more confidence too. And by going over this and, for example, you know, if you review the merge contact screen, maybe once a week, right? You can make sure you stay on top of some of those duplicates that do get created uh, by reviewing, you know, any bad addresses or phone numbers or email addresses. 
you can try to stay on top of that data. And then, depending on the frequency that you do direct mail, might be once a quarter, it might be once a year, whatever the frequency is, you can always come in and you can request an NCOA to make sure you got the latest and greatest in terms of address information. Okay. So that's everything that I wanted to show. So a little bit about what already exists and a little bit of the background on what already exists. So you can kind of understand a little bit more about how this is, is, is working and how it's driving here. Now, I do have some questions coming in. I wanted to make sure that we had some time to review some of those questions. Uh, so we did have a question about dealing with bad records, specifically in the process of a migration. Um, and questions about archiving records in Virtuous. And do archived records count against contracted totals? Now, this comes up a lot, right? And some of you guys may be relatively new clients. Some of you may have been on board for a while. It all depends. But everybody knows our contract is, uh, you know, our pricing is based on record count. Um, but we do not look at those archived records. And, and very often in a migration, right, we'll have data that, that doesn't want to live in Virtuous. But the recommendation, and what I always recommend is to migrate everything and then archive what you don't want. Because archiving contact records will preserve things like their giving history so that all of my financial data is still correct. All my historical financial reporting is still gonna be correct, right? Um, so that's always the easiest way to deal with that. If I have records that I don't want in my database at all, Right? And that could be for a number of reasons, even on an ongoing basis. Maybe I have several contact records where all individuals on the record are deceased. Right? I've got a husband and wife, both are deceased on that record. Then I can archive that record pretty safely. Nothing is gonna be going on there. But again, that preserves the giving history. So when I wanna report on how a certain campaign did a year or two ago, that contact gave to that campaign, all my reporting is going to be accurate and up to date. Okay. And once I archive a contact, don't forget you can always go in and unarchive that contact if you realize, oh, I should not have done that. Right? When I'm on the contact screen, I can go in and view my archived contacts. Now, some of these contacts may be archived because of a merge, in which case you can see who they were merged into. Remember, we talked about. When I merge data, I'm really archiving one record and I'm keeping the other. So here we go, right? So it'll show me, hey, this contact is archived because it was merged into this other contact over here. So you can go ahead and take a look at that contact if you wanna see some of that data. If someone was not merged, so there's nothing they were merged into over here, then I could click on any of those records like Mary Morris up here. And when I click on it, I've got a red button up here to unarchive that record. Until I do that, I can't see anything about this contact record other than it was archived. If I unarchive it, I, I kind of bring it back to life, right? And when a contact is archived, remember, they do not show up in contact queries. They do not show on the contacts screen. I won't see them on my dashboard as best call. They don't exist anywhere. However, I will still see their giving. That's the key thing. Right, and as a matter of fact, if I were to go to the giving tab, I can go in and say, show me all the gifts from contacts who are archived. And that'll show me there's 11 gifts, most of them are from that Mary Morris, even though she's archived. So if I were to go in and pull a query, we can see she last gave in 2017. If I were to pull a query or I were even to do a gift filter and say, give me all the gifts from December 2017 and I export that, I'm going to see this gift here from Mary Morris, but it's going to tell me, hey, that contact is archived, right? Because I want to keep the gift around. I just don't want to keep that contact on hand. Okay. So we did have a question here about custom fields and multi-select custom field, multi-select list type custom fields. Um, we have had that request a few times. That is something that we're looking at on our roadmap for future development, but it is not something that is going to be included, for example, in the release next week. When that might be in the product, I can't say. I don't know for sure. Okay. 
So we had a question about letters on demand, not sending to addresses that cannot be validated. We often see addresses, new residential developments that are not updated in the postal list, even though they are correct. So yes, I need to have a valid address in order to send my letter. Okay. Now it doesn't mean it has to have been validated when I went in and typed in the address. We all know that when I'm entering an address, I can click to have that address validated, right? The one-off validation that gets done in there. Um, that's okay. It doesn't have to do that. But when we go to geocode that address, which I mentioned before, right? That's when we'll say, hey, we cannot, we cannot determine an accurate latitude or longitude for this address. If that is the case, then letters on demand, anyone who's using that, those are not going to get sent to that address, okay? And part of that is to help protect you too, because I know there's a cost per piece for letters on demand, and we don't want to be sending out letters to addresses that are, are just going to get returned. Okay. Uh, and one other question about archiving. Can you mass archive? Of course you can. You can archive contact records from the results of a gift query or even from your contact queue. That is totally fine, right? Whenever you run a query, you've got all of your bulk actions that you can do from there. So uh, I don't know, I got a whole mess of these queries just sitting around here. I don't even know when the last time was I updated this one, we'll find out. But from up here, I have all my bulk actions. One of them would be to archive all of my contacts. There you go. Okay. All right, looks like that is the sum total of our questions for this month. Well, hopefully this was helpful in terms of understanding uh, both how the data health features uh, are designed to work and also to see a little bit of what's coming, the ability to delete directly from that data health screen. I know that's been kind of a, a pain, right? Having to go from that data health screen to go to the contact record, to go in there and then delete the phone number, not fun. So now you can do that all from one place, do it a lot more efficiently. And also being able to ignore some of those so that it'll remove them from that data health list if you've determined, hey, this, this address is as good as it's going to get for example, or hey, this, this phone number format is fine because this is not a US phone number and you just didn't realize that, but it's okay. Please stop yelling at me about my phone number, please. Right, fine to ignore some of those things. Not gonna hurt anything. Okay, so thank you all for joining me. Thank you for the questions. I just wanted to remind you all to tune in next time. Now, we, we usually announce our training webinar topics by quarter. This past quarter, we've done that a little bit differently just because with, uh, well, with the world of fundraising being a little bit uh, turned upside down for the spring, we wanted to make sure that we were kind of adapting as best we could to the needs of certainly all of our clients. But as we start to slide into this new normal, like we all say, we wanted to get back on track. So uh, in the next week, we're going to announce the lineup for those webinars for, for the coming quarter. So you'll see that. Uh, and real quickly, as I, always, I like to leave you with a little bit of inspiration, usually from someone smarter than I. This month, it's something from T. Clay Buck, who is, uh, I only put a couple of his qualifications here. He is a speaker. He's an AFP master trainer. He is a CFRE. He is a consultant uh, in the fundraising space. Uh, he does sit on the advisory board of a major fundraising think tank. He's done pretty much everything. And uh, he is someone who does speak a lot about data health and data hygiene. And one of the things that he said before is you're telling as many stories as you have donors. What do you know about them? And what I really like about that is it kind of takes us out of the, the sort of data geek mindset for a minute, you know, the database uh, mindset for a minute, and start to think about, hey, the, the impact of having clean data is that each one of you know, each one of the records that I have is a unique story, right? And that really falls into that responsive idea of making sure that I'm, I'm seeing each of my donors, I'm tracking what they think, what they feel, how they care, you know, what they're passionate about, what their relationship is to my organization, and I'm responding to what I know about them. Well, I need to make sure that what I know about them is really clean to begin with. So I thought that was a great way to leave this for this month. All right. Thank you, everybody, and I will talk to you again next month.